Welcome to the constructed wetlands here at the UT Gardens in Knoxville. Behind me you see our constructed wetlands here that were built about five years ago. These wetlands uh, are ponds about two feet deep, uh, ranging to about six inches deep in our most shallow pond, and they are catching runoff from the greenhouse parking lots lying just uphill from this space. When it rains, runoff travels through uh, some stormwater drains and daylights in the biggest pond of our wetland in the middle of the site here. Uh, we have four ponds total, and uh, this is protecting the Tennessee River from um, any of the stormwater pollutants that might be carried from the paved areas, from the parking lots, uh, washing off our cars every time it rains, also any excess fertilizers or other chemicals that might be in the landscape uh, being carried by that stormwater runoff. It actually gets uh, infiltrated and, and retained here in our wetlands uh, to help pull out some of those pollutants before the excess water flows through the storm drains and into the Tennessee River where it was before, where it was going before we built the wetlands. But now we've got this extra layer of a wetland ecosystem helping to protect against uh, those, uh, that risk of pollution uh, every time it rains, capturing that stormwater runoff and utilizing the natural processes uh, inherent to a wetland ecosystem to absorb those pollutants, absorb that potential uh, flooding risk and buffer out any impacts to um, our sensitive aquatic ecosystems here in East Tennessee. So we have a couple different types of wetlands on display here in our constructed wetland uh, pond series. Behind me, you see our shallowest pond. And this pond, uh, it ranges in depth. Uh, right after it rains, when it's full to capacity, it'll hold about a foot of water. Um, but this pond is mimicking an, an ephemeral wetland. So that means it's gonna dry up during part of the year. There's no artificial liner in the bottom, uh, and that's different than the other three ponds in our constructed wetland. And so this one is going to be wet during, uh, right after rain events and during the wet season, but typically in the middle of the summer and towards this driest month we are here in, in, all, in October, uh, typically you would find this ephemeral wetland having uh, drained all the water um, uh, during this dry part of the year. But since we are having an abnormally wet year here in Knoxville, you see behind me, we do have some um, open surface water uh, here present in our ephemeral wetlands. So this year, this wetland is probably acting more like a perennial wetland, um, but it's still showcasing some species that you would find uh, in that ephemeral wetland hydrology, wetlands that will take on water, be seasonally inundated and inundated right after it rains, but then also these plants are able to tolerate some drying out during the dry seasons. So let's take a look at some of the plants we have here in this wetland. So here around the edge of the wetland pond, you see that we've got several types of native irises. So blue flag iris and copper iris. We also have some volunteer heath asters coming into uh, the edge here as well. And then just below that, kind of emerging out of the water, we've got our lizard's tail which was blooming earlier this summer. And blooming right now, we also have our bull tongue arrowhead, a nice white flower. And then a little bit lower than that, you can see some of the leaves of the pickerel weed. And pickerel weed will bloom uh, purple throughout most of the summer. And you can still find a few of those blooms here in early fall as well. And then working down into the deepest part of the pool, you see we've got a shrub there and that is buttonbush. And buttonbush is a really versatile shrub that you would find uh, naturally on stream banks, but then also in these ephemeral wetlands, it can actually grow right out of the water. So a great shrub for those wet areas, especially when you're going to have surface ponding. Here we are in our largest pool of our constructed wetland series here. And um, this is a wetland that reflects a perennial wetland hydrology. Uh, so it is uh, standing water year round. And this pond, when uh, in between rain events, sits right at about two feet of water depth. 
And then when it rains and the runoff comes into the wetland, it will go up to about two and a half feet of water depth and then slowly drain and meter that water out uh, through the overflow um, as, as the storms reside. So um, this wetland pond, like I said, is a perennial wetland pond. And uh, wouldn't you know it, when we did our soil testing here, we actually found a nice clay loam uh, soil. And it had a little bit more sand in it than I felt comfortable with uh, trying to create that perennially wet pond and being confident that it would hold water all year round. So we actually came in and put in an artificial liner uh, in order to, to give us that uh, year-round perennial pool that we were looking for. And so the uh, liner that we used here was a synthetic uh, HDPE um, 30 mil liner. And that's this blue thing, blue liner right here. And um, it is protected on both sides by some very thick uh, geotextile material. So when we created these ponds, we excavated out the soil lay down our first layer of geotextile material, then put in the synthetic liner, and then on top of that, another layer of geotextile material, and then we actually backfilled the whole footprint of the pond with about 46 inches of the soil material, native soil from the site. And that was to give us a kind of natural habitat, natural soil bottom throughout the whole wetland area, and then also something to plant into along the edges. So that added, um, added habitat, benthic uh, bottom habitat to the wetland, and then, like I said, gave us something for our plants to hold into on the edges. So this wetland, uh, this synthetic liner is lining each of the three remaining pools here um, in the constructed wetland, and then a kind of low channel uh, connects each of the wetland ponds, and so when that rain comes in, when that runoff uh, comes into the wetland and the wetland uh, is, is inundated, all pools will be connected uh, through those surface channels and then as the water recedes um, then the pools become disconnected and it's dry in between each of those three pools. So let's take a look at the water depth here. Um, I mentioned the water depth here in our deepest pool is about two feet and you can see here yeah we're about 20 24 inches of water depth here and again, this was trying to give us a perennial wetland hydrology. And that's really important for several things. Uh, first off, we were trying to just showcase a, a year-round wetland feature here with uh, standing water, open surface water year-round. Um, but then that also provides year-round habitat for uh, a lot of different wildlife species. And in particular, we're very interested in having insects present in these wetlands that will prey on uh, any mosquitoes that try to, uh, to, to live in this space. So particularly some mosquito predators that we're trying to attract here and that we've been able to document every year since we built these wetlands are um, things like dragonflies, damselflies, and water beetles. And um, dragonflies and uh, damselflies, they need a perennial pool of water, uh, year-round water, um, and, and their uh, aquatic larvae and nymph stages, those life cycle uh, components are carried out in the water, and then they will emerge into their adult form that we're all used to. But they need at least uh, that year-round water in order to carry out their life cycle. So another interesting fact about that life cycle is that they also need plants to help, uh, to help guide that emergence. So they actually use the waterline vegetation to uh, climb out of the water and uh, complete their life cycle. And so this pickerel weed uh, clump right here acts as that uh, habitat for them as they emerge from their nymph form, uh, climb out onto the pickerel weed, shed their exoskeletons. Oftentimes, especially in the summer months, spring and summer months, you'll be able to look in here and find um, dragonfly exoskeletons still hanging on to this uh, vegetation right at the water's edge. And then you'll see the adult forms, uh, dragonflies, flying around the ponds as well. So it's really critical that uh, not only to demonstrate some of the, the plants and this open water feature, year-round water in our perennial wetland, but then also trying to create that uh, full food web here that will help suppress any nuisance uh, mosquito larvae from, from being able to, to thrive here. So let's take a look at some of the plants here in mm -hmm. our constructed wetland. 
Again, we're in our deepest pool here, about two feet of water depth in this wetland pond. And as you can see at the water's edge, we do have quite a bit of duckweed here. It's actually one of the smallest uh, vascular plants in the plant kingdom. So that's duckweed that you see on the surface here, maybe mixed in with a little bit of water meal. The ducks actually do eat this. They forage on it and uh, gain a lot of nutrients from it. Uh, working to the water's edge, we see some more of our bull tongue arrowhead and our pickerel weed. Again, these are very vital for um, the dragonflies and other insects to be able to emerge from the water and complete their life cycle into their adult form. And then just about uh, two to six inches above the water line, we'll start to see some other perennials uh, in the mix there. Uh, we've got some um, swamp mallow, some joe pie weed, and uh, again, some heath asters volunteering pretty nicely here. And um, we'll also have around here during different times of year, you can find cardinal flower and great blue lobelia and really a whole suite of other uh, native water's edge perennial plants. And then finally, the top layer of vegetation, our shrub layer. Uh, we've got some indigo bush, another volunteer um, uh, willow coming in right here. And also one of my favorites is the uh, uh, gray twig uh, dogwood behind us there. Um, also uh, silky dogwood as well. We find uh, both those dogwood species here. Uh, again, naturally you would be able to find them along water's edge, uh, in a streamside buffer, or in these wet margins. And uh, these two native dogwoods, uh, dogwood shrubs, are really uh, great because they have really pretty foliage in the fall, uh, produce nice, uh, deep, kind of navy color berries, and that nice lacy white cap bloom in the spring as well.